was a popular libertarian revolution. There was a lot to learn from it. It was not spontaneous. It had been developed for you know, 50 years of intensive organizing, uh, experimentation, uh, schools, uh, revolts, uh, which partially succeeded, crushed, but it left a memory. Barcelona, nobody's calling him a 
serve people are comrades. Uh, there's no hierarchy of people are participating. So I don't understand what it was. You know, a lot of things I don't like, but it's something you just have to appreciate. You know, came back a couple months later, and he said, it's totally different. You know, you're back to the bowing and scraping the orders of uh, Stalinist communist leadership that taken over, crushed the revolution, was in the process of crushing the revolution with the support of the West and you know, the support of Franco. Uh, but that's, uh, you know, even from his skewed perspective, just as a perceptive human being, he saw something really important happening here. And if you read the uh, documents on the collectivization, by now they're available. Actually, when I was writing about it this long time ago, I had to use uh, original documents, which I picked up bookstores around 1940, but uh, by, by now they're all available. You know, it's a cost scholarship, the original documents are out, you can really learn quite a lot about it. And yeah, it's an inspiring experience, I think, with lots of lessons. Okay, uh, Ushi. Uh, you said before that uh, the class war is occurring, but that not everyone seems to be aware of that. Um, just a question that I want to ask is, uh, what do you think of the significance and the relevance of class analysis for libertarian social politics? Yeah, remains of continuing relevance. There are class differences that are important. Uh, part of the strength of the anarchist tradition is to recognize that that's only some of the forms of hierarchy and domination. There's a lot of others, but they're crucially significant. They're struggling in Ireland all the time, and everywhere else. Recent strikes are an example. I mean, class war always goes on. I mean, there's one class that relentlessly fights class war, the business class. They never relent for a minute. And so they're always fighting a vicious class war. Uh, they want everybody else to pretend it doesn't exist. But, you know, for them, it's a permanent, permanent war. <coughs> Any attempt to, and you know, the whole doctrinal system schools, media, and so on, tries to prevent people from seeing it. They come up, we're all in it together, in harmony, this and that. But uh, what's the business world doing? And the business and government are so closely connected, you can barely distinguish them. But business, uh, government, uh, you know, educational hierarchies, uh, you know, they're always fighting the class war. I mean, every time you look at an advertisement on television, it's class war. It's trying to turn you into a passive consumer. So you won't talk to other people and you know, try to figure out some wrong with all of these things. Uh, there's not a moment when you're not engaged in class war. You can decide, you know, you can succumb and say, I'm going to notice it. But it's uh, hitting you every minute of the day down to the infant. I mean, when I watch uh, television with my grandchildren, you know, three year old kids, uh, you just take a look at what's being presented to them on television. I mean, they're being deeply indoctrinated into passivity, conformism, consumerism, uh, you know, the rejection of conflict, uh, failing. You know, this is just a class war, a constant class war never stops. So sure, class analysis is important. It's not the only thing that's going on, but it's a major problem. And Toby? Having been part of the Sense of politics and speaking at events like this since uh, the American invasion of South Vietnam. How have you noticed the change in the reception of yourself and your ideas? Well, um, when I started speaking about the invasion of South Vietnam, for one thing, you couldn't use the phrase. Uh, it, it was years. I mean, in, in an educated audience, you still can't use the phrase. Like I was talking at Harvard Graduate School, you know, couldn't use the words, it would be like talking uh, in Sumerian. Uh, because the words don't exist. I mean, have you ever seen it in a newspaper or a scholarly work or anything? I mean, just no such thing except in the real world. There is still no such a thing. Uh, so first of all, you can talk about it. Uh, furthermore, the audiences were, uh, I don't know, three or four people in some living room, or uh, occasionally be at church, where uh, there'd be four people there, you know, the pastor, Kindly gave us the church, or the organizer, or a, a drunk who walked in, <laughs> some other guy who wanted, wanted American. <laughs> uh, when the uh, anti war movement began in the early 60s, 
Manuscript, and I would even close to the mid, like 1964, you know, that late. If we wanted to have a meeting somewhere at, say, a college, we'd have to bring together you know, half a dozen topics, you know, Iran, Venezuela, you know, Brazil, Vietnam, you know, and maybe get 10 people to come out because they're interested in different things. Uh, in fact, uh, it really, I mean, for the first pub in Boston where I live is the most liberal city in the country. It's, they like to call themselves the Athens of America, Harvard, all this kind of stuff. Uh, but uh, it's the center of American liberalism. I mean, the first public meeting against the war was the International Days of Solidarity Against the War. It was October 15th, 1965. And there were demonstrations all around the world. So we figured, okay, we'll try to have an outdoor demonstration in Boston. There had been one before on any scale. And there's a place in Boston, it's Boston Common, which is what the free speech area, sort of Hyde Park. So there was a march down to Boston Common. A couple of speakers, I was supposed to be one of the speakers, so, you know, big mobs of counter demonstrators, mostly coming from universities. Uh, there to break up the demonstration. Uh, you know, couldn't get a word out. Nobody could be heard. In fact, the only reason we weren't slaughtered was there were a couple hundred state cops around who didn't like what we were saying, but didn't want to see people murdered on the Boston Common. Uh, <laughs> the next day, in the newspapers, take a look at the Boston Globe, the most liberal newspaper in the country. Uh, the front page, the entire front page was devoted to this big picture in front of a wounded soldier. You know, there's a soldier fighting for freedom, and uh, the rest of it was all about these uh, county rats trying to undermine our brave soldiers, you know, that kind of stuff. The radio was full of it, you know, there's denunciations. If you go to Congress, uh, the people who later pretended to be, after the war went sour, uh, everybody suddenly became a long-time secret dove, you know, really secret. <laughs> uh, but then a memoir, Kennedy memoir, so we wrote their memoirs and so on. We got a new story. But uh, uh, people like you know, the people who later became celebrated as uh, anti war heroes, Mike Mansfield and others, uh, were denouncing what they called the irresponsibility of the protesters. And, and in a way, they were right because the protests were so mild, it was embarrassing. <laughs> this is uh, literally embarrassing to say the words. This was four years after uh, Kennedy had launched a major war against South Vietnam. And before that war, there were about 70,000 people who had been killed by the U.S. client state. Uh, 61, 62 was when the major war started, it was all against the South. But in February 1965, uh, that's when they started bombing the North. And that's what he could protest against, the bombing of the North. And the rest, most of the anti-war movement from that point on was against the bombing of the North. Well, you know, the bombing of the North was an atrocity, but didn't come close to what was going on in South Vietnam. Not even close. You know. But that's kind of gone from history. And part of the reason is that the anti-war movement either didn't understand, which is partly largely true, or just couldn't pick it up. Well, that was February 1965. Uh, by that time, there were about 200 or 250,000 American troops in South Vietnam rampaging, and the country was almost gone. You know, I mean, it's been totally devastated. Uh, and so it went. To, by 1967 and 68, there was a substantial popular movement, you know, and you know, tens of thousands of people, and sort of thing. Uh, but still, the focus was mostly in Europe too. The focus was on the bombing of the North. And there's a reason for that. It's not a pretty reason. Uh, the reason is that the attack on South Vietnam was costless for the United States. I mean, just the killing and massacring completely defenseless people. Nobody cares. When you bombed North Vietnam, it was more dangerous. But for one thing, you're hitting Russian ships in the Haiphong Harbor. Uh, you're bombing a Chinese railroad. Uh, the way the French built railroads, the Chinese railroad people in the South happened to go through North Vietnam. So you start bombing a Chinese railroad, well, the Chinese might react, uh, the Russians might react. But if you bomb anywhere near Hanoi, uh, you're bombing European embassies. You know, they get upset. And 
for the murder reporters up there. So they'll go, you know, 20 miles around Hanoi and the sea villages wiped out. You know, don't like it. Uh, so bombing the north carried costs, and therefore it was an issue. The bombing the south carried no costs. Uh, and it's striking when you read the declassified, you know, depending on papers, you're kind of like stolen archives. You get the real story, not what's declassified by the government. And therefore, they're almost ignored by scholarship and by the media, practically ignored. But they're very revealing. For example, one of the things they show is that the bombing of the North was planned in meticulous detail. You know, they really thought about it, how far should we go? They take a look at the bombing of the South, it's, it's not even mentioned. They just do whatever they feel like. You know? so, uh, uh, so there's barely any mention of planning you want to target villages with B-52 bombing from them to do it and so forth. Uh, and the anti-war movement is responsible for this too because they kept to the same framework of overwhelmingly. Uh, and that's the picture that lasts in history. So the history of the war, that's what it is. Uh, the anti by the late 60s, things really had changed. And a lot of other things have changed too because the, you know, the anti-war movement just kind of integrated with a lot of other things that were going on. Uh, so you, you're barely beginning, beginning to get the beginnings of the feminist movement at that time. And the sources of it, I don't know what it's like here, but in the United States it's very striking to watch. Now, part of these sources of the women's movement were the sexism of the anti-war movement. Very striking. You can see it. Uh, the, especially the draft resistors. I was working a lot with resistance. And the draft resistors were brave people. You know, 17, 18 year old kids who are facing a real problem, not fun to spend you know, years in jail, or go to exile, and never get back home. And they felt righteous, you know. And part of the way he felt righteous was by uh, oppressing young women, who then sort of supposed to serve you and admire you and so on. And the women, after a while, started to resent uh, because uh, the general typical anarchist sentiments of not being want to, being, want to be kicked around were coming up. And that uh, led to a uh, critique of the sexism of the young resistors, which for many of them was a real crisis. I mean, I know some who actually committed suicide because they couldn't deal with it. You know, here's this sense that we're doing something really courageous, and, uh, but we're oppressors. How can we face that? Uh, and that was a good part of where the women's movement came from. The women's movement really didn't develop a major force until the 70s, but it was part of the group. Uh, the environmental movement was barely beginning. The civil rights movement, which is an interesting story, as long as the civil rights movement was focused on, you know, hideous uh, sheriffs in Alabama, it was very popular in the North. <laughs> but by the mid-60s, it was shifting to the North. The last couple of years, we just had Martin Luther King did, you know, to celebrate Martin Luther King. What they celebrated is what he was doing in the South. By 1965, he was turning to organizing a poor people's movement, and that's all over the country. And in fact, when he was assassinated, it was at a time when he was in the midst of the speaking of meeting the poor people's movement. Well, that's out of, you know, kind of like out, going too far. You know. So when you read about Martin Luther King, they say, well, the last couple of years of his life, he kind of lost direction. You know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you know, it's okay to be self-righteous about Alabama sheriffs, but to not to look at what's happening in your neighborhood, which is the same thing. You know. uh, but uh, that was be the civil rights movement was beginning to turn into a you know, like a general movement of the poor. It was very frightening to power systems, and uh, but it was going on, and a lot of organizing was going on. There's a lot of craziness. You know. The youth culture was going on in its own way. You know, just revolt, the music, the style of dress, all kinds of things. Uh, but the general effect was extraordinary. I mean, it's uh, and it's lasting. And the whole country just changed, became just more civilized. Like my own university, MIT, uh, if when around 19, 
60, say, uh, MIT was uh, white males, uh, well-dressed, tossing jackets, obedient, <coughs> deferential, did their homework, and so on. If you walk around MIT today, it looks like this. Half women, literally, half women, you know, third minority, with a casual dress, uh, informal relationships, you know, to do serious work or serious in the floor, but uh, just totally different. And the same is true all over the country. So as far as, say, reaction goes, the, you know, educated elite sectors are very more rigid than they were, because they were frightened by all of this. There's a tremendous backlash against it. The liberal com- liberals and comes from everything else, all part of the backlash. But among the population, it's just expanded all over. I give a talk in the, in the Idaho Washington border, in a little town where all you see in the town is uh, Christian evangelical posters and you know, the National Rifle Association and so on. You know, 4,000 people show up uh, you know, from nowhere, and it's around there. It's and that happens all over. I mean, I spend maybe an hour a night, I spend a lot of time answering email, but uh, probably an hour a night is just turning down invitations, which I really like to accept. Uh, and the, the, there are very few people, unfortunately, who are publicly available. You know, it's not the kind of thing that privileged people do. We're all obviously very privileged, but uh, they don't do it. You know, so there are very few people who will do these things and they're just overwhelming demand and they get the same reaction. I mean, you know, Howard Zinn, I'm sure, who is another one who's on the road all the time, though he's not young, he's older than I am, but uh, he's out there all the time. <laughs> 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 but, and he's just a garage with invitations and gets the same reaction, thousands of people showing up. But, you know, so it's just a tremendous change in the whole country. It just became a lot more civilized. <laughs> And it, it, you know, a lot of very striking ways, which aren't discussed much, but they're very real. So I take in the 1980s, if you take a look at what happened, it's quite a bit striking. When Reagan came in in 1981, he was facing a problem. He, you know, don't know what was going on, but the guys around him were facing the problems in Central America, which were very much like what Kennedy faced in South Vietnam in 1961, very similar. And they f- tried to follow the Kennedy model. You know, Kennedy was their hero, uh, very much unlike the picture that's been created. Uh, they tried to follow in Central America the same model that Kennedy did in South Vietnam. You can see it step by step. Same white papers, you know, the comments are taking over, and the whole business. Uh, the media went along totally, you know, yeah, communists are taking over the world, uh, they, and so on. Uh, but they had to back off. Uh, they had to back off because it was just too much popular opposition. And a lot of it was coming from the church, a lot from popular groups and so on. So they backed off and they carried out the, what they call the clandestine war. That's a war which means everybody knows about it except the American population. I mean, obviously the victims know, the participants know, and so on. But they keep it away from the population so they don't find out about it. I mean, it, it's called the... the Name for it is called the Vietnam Syndrome. And there's an effort to present it as if Americans don't want to face casualties. It's a total lie. It has nothing to do with Americans facing casualties. You know, people are, if there's something they think of as like a just war, Second World War, you know, then Americans are casualties to do it. What they don't want to face is aggressive war. But you can't say that. You, know, you can't make that public. But there's a deep feeling that we don't want to be involved in an aggressive war. I and mean, that's why they dropped the draft. Now, the draft is a citizen's army. And they just can't get a citizen's army to fight colonial wars. That's something the British knew 200 years ago. You know, they didn't use British soldiers, they used mercenaries, French, everyone else. But the U.S. dropped the citizen's army. Uh, and uh, instead, they have a mercenary army. It's called a volunteer army. But it's just a mercenary army of the disadvantaged. People like Lindy England, you know, the woman who was this Abu Ghraib thing. You just look at her background, you see where they're coming from. I mean, they're really oppressed people. Uh, no education, no, no opportunities, nothing. They, uh, when they recruit for, for you know, 
soldiers, they don't go to Harvard Square. You know, they go downtown to the Boston Slum. Uh, where you can pick up people who figure, okay, maybe I've got a way out of this. And those kind of people you can train to become, you know, train killers. Or you just use plain mercenaries. They're called contractors or something like that. They're just mercenaries. They're a foreign legion. Uh, and, uh, or you use special forces, like British special forces have been used as mercenaries all over the world. They're really good at kicking people in the face. around here now. But uh, the... Uh, uh, but that was part of it. By the time it got to the 80s, uh, they couldn't carry out an invasion. Uh, so they used mercenary forces from Taiwan, Britain, Israel, other places, uh, funding from Saudi Arabia, you know, just, or just uh, organized mercenary army like in, in Nicaragua, El Salvador, used the state security forces. And they did carry out pretty hideous massacre, but it was nothing like an invasion. It's not B-52s. You're getting the signal for time. You're getting the signal for time. Okay, well, last comment about this, because it's quite important and not discussed. That something completely new happened in the 1980s, new in hundreds of years of, of Western imperialism. There was a solidarity movement in which people actually went to live with the victims. And that's never happened. You know, nobody thought to go live in a Vietnamese village during the Vietnam War. Nobody from France went to live in an Algerian village. It was considered very heroic if you wrote an article in Le Mans saying, you know, I don't want to torture or something. And then you're a big hero, and so on and so forth. But in the 1980s, literally tens of thousands of Americans went to Central America. A lot of them stayed there. Went to but, uh, uh, and they were mostly coming from the mainstream. One, one of the reasons why it's unknown is it was not happening in the elite centers. Like it wasn't happening in Cambridge. It was happening in churches in Kansas, and Arizona, and places like that. A lot of it was coming out of the Christian evangelical movements, contrary to what you hear. Uh, and the very serious, sincere people were dedicated to just coming out of <coughs> a much more civilized country. Uh, and when it gets to the global justice movement, you know, it's just something totally like it uh, anywhere you know, all over the world. So yes, there's been a lot of changes, very positive ones. I mean, you know, they're not going to be giving headlines in the newspapers, of course, but they're, you know, they're happening. So you would never have seen a group like this, certainly not 40 years ago, even 20 years ago. And now you've seen them all over the place. You know, I was up in Carolina, and my wife were up in northeast Brazil, and they have Giving various talks, but an anarchist group asked me to come talk in northeast Brazil. And I think uh, you enjoyed that one. Uh, so, uh, although we would really love to talk for hours on this yeah. these subjects, I um, want to thank you very much for taking the time out of your schedule. And it's with you and Carol. Some of the Irish whiskey. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> <laughs>